Welcome. Well, thank you everyone for joining. My name is Luke O'Borny. I am currently serving as customer sales supervisor here at Nextech. I have been in this role for roughly 15 years. I've been with Nextech for roughly 17 years. And in some past lives, I did uh, retail management and other types of things as well. So sales and that type of thing is not exactly new to me. So today we're going to talk about how to empower your, uh, your customer sales team or um, getting more out of them as well. So All right, Jody, can I get a thumbs up? You can see and it's presenting accurately. Awesome, perfect, thank you so much. All right, so empowering your customer sales team or, or another one I always look at is getting the most out of it. So our agenda real quick, uh, like she said, the first 15, 20 minutes are gonna be, um, this is some, some I pick of the top five. Um, some sales training, you know, making sure that they're sales ready and they know what they're doing. Some product training, that can be your products and then kind of just other products in general. Saving a service, you know, churn is always an important thing we're always looking at. Um, and so it's kind of, well, could we use our, 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 our customer service and our customer sales team to do that? Um, conflict resolution. As you know, these are our frontline employees. So conflict sometimes does come up. And then just general empowerment. And so we'll start real quick with what I call sales training. And so the basis for that, I always call this sales 101. And, and, and this is what I consider the most important rule in, in sales. It's, it's how you present the information how you word things, how you say things. So in one of my past lives, I sold a ton of, um, I'm just gonna use the word fake alligator skin wallets. And uh, they were 20 bucks and they went like crazy. And I sold them every time by saying, this is genuine imitation alligator. People would sat there and they scratch their head, genuine imitation alligator. And it just, it got a conversation, it got a spark, but it's how you word everything. So, uh, and learning what I'm going to call a sales process. And so long gone are the days of, of us, of telcos just being a monopoly, you know, long gone are, well, if you want phone service, you come to us. With technology changes, with the world being different, um, we just, we really need to be in more of a sales type role. And that a lot of times involves what I call leading the conversation. Um, you want to guide it to, you know, to a certain outcome. And so I really focus on what we call needs-based selling. And why do I do that? Because let's face it, nobody likes salespeople. Why don't we like them? Because they're pushy and they don't listen to us. And we all have our reasons. That is, and, and I agree 100%. I don't like them people either. Needs-based selling is entirely different. It's going to be based off of everyone calls in, goes to the website, um, does something for a specific reason. They are needing a brown pair of pants. They're needing internet. They're needing something specific. And it's our job to figure out why they called in, why they went to the website, why did they why they walk in the store? You know, what was their need that brought them here? Um, and from that, then you can develop things like upselling and suggestive selling and cross-selling other services. Um, and that's, again, a need type thing. You figure out what their needs are, and then those other steps are very easy. Um, and always selling will call the benefits. You know, I mean, how is this going to benefit the customer? And when you think about that as anything you've ever purchased, um, some of your best experiences when you purchase something have always been, they listen to me, and they really, this is going to be a huge benefit to me. And so that's the same sales process that I recommend you you kind of go with and work with. Now, with that, you're going to want to have some quotas, um, accountability. You know, you want to have some numbers that, that they should try and strive for and hit um, and maybe even some outbound calls. A lot of times we will work through specific lists. We'll try to target maybe specific customers that we want to move um, to a higher speed of Internet or something else. There's usually always a, some reason. Uh, and 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 when I say outbound calls, I'm always going to call them warm calls. You know, I mean, the cold calling again, that's an old school mentality and I don't I don't recommend it. It doesn't work well. Um, but a warm call is always there's already a prior relationship, you know, and and usually you're trying to offer us something. You give them a, um, a tidbit or something, you know, hey, if you do this, you know, if you want to try this speed for a little bit, we'll keep it the same price for three months. Some some little enticement. And then, of course, mystery shopping and sales coaching. And I kind of recommend you kind of do both of those. So you have some metrics, something to look at. Uh, mystery shopping, usually I recommend an outside company. You hire an outside company and they will you mystery shop you and you can set up um, different times. Uh, for us, we just do it every quarter. So four times a year, they're mystery shopped. And then in between that, we run sales coaching uh, with our customer sales supervisors on any of those that are scoring low. Product training. So it kind of breaks down a couple things here. Understanding things like data. If you're going to sell internet, 
Um, you want to make sure your people have a general understanding of, of data, of technology, and what I call the Internet of Things. So um, you have to know your own product. They got to know the speeds. They got to know what those product details are. They got to know what the install is going to be about. Um, we generally call those details of service, you know, things that are required for service, how that install may go, how that may be. Um, maybe you want to do some job shadowing, let them run out with a tech or something else so they kind of can answer all those questions and know all those details. They're going to need to know some some terms and terminology here: speed, latency, you know, bandwidth usage, number of devices. Um, you know, again, with internet and a needs-based selling, what's the first thing you would ask? How many devices you can have connected, and what are you going to be doing on the internet? And because that's going to decide real quick bandwidth usage and and help make a strong recommendation. You know, smart things. Everything seems to connect to the internet anymore. And I'm not saying you have to have experts about every individual device. That would be ridiculous. But you want to know some of the common things. You want to know, yep, this is a smart plug. And these are one of the 12 popular brands. These are smart cameras. This is a, um, a thermostat or, or a garage door opener. I mean, everything that connects. You don't have to be an expert in every field, but you don't necessarily want someone going, what are, you, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about that. That would be a, a, a training issue that I'd want to address and look at. Things like cloud storage, you know, I mean, why is cloud storage so important? Because you're storing everything in the cloud. So everything has to go up and down. And so where's it going through? It's going through your internet connection. And so that's going to make a big difference on what type of speed you want. Um, and of course, after COVID, everyone works from home. And so that's a whole other variable that you'd want to come up and everything else. And usually when you start asking questions, people are always like, yeah, I don't have a lot of devices. Then you start asking about specific devices and they have a ton of devices and they don't realize it. So, um, and then of course, routers, access points, um, you know, if you happen to be selling um, selling those or adding those, you know, I mean, you're going to have to have, they want to have an understanding of the product that you could offer and maybe even some of the products they could buy elsewhere. And what are the differences? You know, I mean, what are the, what, what's the reason that they should go with yours? You know, yours is probably a mesh device, whereas with the one you buy at Walmart or whatever else is not. Um, but again, you want your front lines to know that. Churn, saving the service. So what's our situation? Um, number one is just to assess that situation. You know, you can't save everything. Uh, Luke got married. He's moving in with someone. Well, that's not a safe situation. Luke's moving out of the area. Can't save that one either, you know. But there are situations where, um, you know, Luke's just calling to disconnect. Well, why is Luke disconnecting? You know what I mean? Um, and so you're going to have to ask questions. And I'm just going to be brutally honest. I don't understand the why, probably because of my personality. But this is a hard one for people. This is going to be something you're going to train in. Really, you're going to follow the same process here that you would as far as a sales type uh, environment. You know, I mean, assess the situation, make a friend, ask questions to get their needs, make a recommendation, um, try to get a commitment from them from that. It's the same process when you're as far as selling a service, but it's awkward and and hard. And I don't know, maybe I relate it to dating. You know, why don't you like me? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. But it is hard for people. It's really hard for people. So you got to ask questions. And then you have to really dig down deep, too, because you got to watch. This is a trap you fall into. Um, well, um, what's the verbiage they always say? Um, it's, it's something with, let's just say money, money in general, or I can't afford it. Well, can't afford it is really subjective because there's two ways to look at that. One is Luke just lost his job. He truly cannot afford to pay for the service. Number two is, is, it's more than Luke wants to pay or is willing to pay for the service. And you got to ask questions to get the right one there because, you know, Luke's not willing to continue to pay you $69 a month for internet, but maybe he's willing to pay someone else $69 a month for internet. So that those are questions you need to want to ask and figure out. And so it's situational. You got to get into that and really dig down a little bit. Sometimes then to win it back over, you just got to restate your advantages. You know, I mean, maybe you have an awesome help desk. Maybe your technicians will, you know, come out and work on the weekends. Maybe, I mean, there, there can be all sorts of different things. And so sometimes it's just, hey, I don't know if you're aware, we offer all these cool things and people just don't know that. Um, other times you might want to present some sort of an offer. And this could be a dollar off. There can be all sorts of things. And um, this kind of will tie into empowerment, which is we're getting to as, as next. But it, it really could be um, one of the biggest things I found and I love that we use is a with a commitment of service. Notice I didn't word, use the word contract. Uh, what did I tell you earlier about how you word things? You know, it's a commitment of service. So you know what? Hey, I understand things have gone up. We've got the rates and everything else. You know, if you're going to sign a commitment of service, you're going to keep the internet and the TV service for the next two years. I could give you $20 off a month, you know? And so 
it's a win-win, you know? I mean, yeah, you're given a slight discount, but you've locked them in for two years. And I highly then recommend you have some sort of an ETF then as well, um, an early termination fee if they decide to to back out of that. So again, you know, I mean, it, it, it locks in that revenue, you know? And so um, I always say on any of these situations in a, in a customer sales environment, it's meeting in the middle. Um, the other thing you'll hear me use quite a bit is it's the gray area. <laughs> you know, customer wants this and they're very black about it. The company wants that and it's very white. We operate in the gray, you know, and that kind of ties into our empowerment as well. Sometimes you have to negotiate. Sometimes you go in the middle. Um, the only thing here I will say, uh, a cautionary thing is avoid things like months of free service. Well, Luke, if I give you a month of free service, would you keep it? Everyone is going to say yes. And they'll take your free service for a month. And then they disconnect next month. And so um, that one does not work well. And so uh, don't do that. There is one exception to that. And that is COVID. <laughs> COVID, that one actually worked really well. Um, we had several situations where jobs were lost, lives were changed. It was a, a very large traumatic event. And I had a couple situations where I actually did use that one. And it was basically just, I got to disconnect. I just, dis, bills and this and that. And I was like, okay, so you don't really want to disconnect. And so again, I asked, and I got questions for the service. You don't really want to disconnect. You don't really want to do this. Um, but if, if, you know, this month's bill, you just can't make it. I was like, yeah. And I said, so next month you want to re-sign up? Boy, if I can sure afford it. Well, how about I just cover this month's bill? You know, I was like, well, let's just, I'll, I'll cover it. It's not going to exist. You keep being our customer. You know, I mean, if you wanted to get whatever, you could try and look at maybe putting a commitment on there. It's kind of up to you. Um, but that worked well in that situation. And ultimately, what's our goal here? Reduce the number of disconnects. So the only other thing I will say on the whole saving of a service, this one's always weird for people too. So we have made it, what our, our goal here is to have one successful save a month. And I'd like you to have a minimum of three to maybe four attempts. So what I'm basically saying is 25% of the time, I want you to be successful at this. That's a tough one because in the world, name anything else that, hey, 25% is good. You know, your kid comes home tonight and says, I got 25% of the test. You are not happy. You know I mean? Well, I'm, I'm really good 25% of the time. <laughs> not good. <laughs> you know, but this is one of those things with a, with a, a save environment or a churn environment. 25% is awesome. And so um, sometimes it's, you got to set what I call a realistic expectation. And so that can be, again, a conversation you have, some training, making sure that they understand and know what's going on. So all this really is going to tie together with just general empowerment of your people. And I am very big on this. Um, I wish I could still find it. I used to use this years ago in training. It was on YouTube. Enterprise, Enterprise, I draw a blank on the company. Enterprise was the name of the company. And they had this whole thing about talking about their company and this, that, and the other. And it was like, you know, this, the situation, but if anything goes wrong, I can make it right. And then they had a series of all these different people, you know, at different locations. And, and you could just tell it was different areas and everything else. And that was their tag. I can make it right. I can make it right. I can make it right. And so I just, I just, it was such a powerful marketing piece. I loved it. And it really took it to heart. At the end of the day, Luke's personal feeling here, there should be nothing that your frontline people cannot be empowered to do that you are also not willing to yourself. There should never be a situation where it has to come to a supervisor or it has to come to me to resolve anything. And some of that can be a training issue. Some of that's going to be time. You know, I mean, you're brand new people three to six months in. Um, there's a lot to learn, a lot going on. You know, I mean, they're not going to feel comfortable. So it's not a rush thing. It's not like you have to do this but you definitely want to make sure that they have that and they feel empowered. Um, it's, it's, it's so powerful, you know, um, it's so powerful. And I, and I want you to think back of every retail experience you've had that you've just gone away going, Oh my gosh, that was just amazing. You know what I mean? This, this went wrong and it was just such a mess, but this person just stepped in and took care of it. And, they did it with empowerment. You know what I mean? Their employer had set it up. Their employer had set up what they, and maybe they had training. Maybe they just said, do what you got to do, take care of the customer. You know, you can decide that background to how you want to do it. But, and I have a list here in some of the situations, you know, maybe it's an install problem. Do well, do you give an extra discount? Do you give an extra month free service? What, what can they do? Um, smoothing over any sort of customer situation. Maybe there's a billing issue. You know, maybe it's a save situation. Kind of like we talked about before. Suspend situations. I know we all joke. You know, I mean, oh my gosh, everyone just got out of the hospital. Everyone just did this. Everyone just did that. Um, but 
you got to be really cautious on that because sometimes that really did just happen. You know, they really did not get their bill. This really did. I mean, they, there, there are situations and everything else, and you got to be ready for that. Um, I call it the common sense, compassion, and personal touch. So from a marketing aspect, you know, I mean, you're always hearing that term touch. You got to touch a customer so many times. You got to do this, got to that. And I am saying this should be a part of that because if you look at these things and you look at your customer experiences and your brand loyalty, you know, I mean, what, what your, you know, stuff you always go to, you know, whether you're a Ford person, a Chevy person, um, if you like Ariad jeans or whatever that could possibly be, um, why is that? And what, what are those reasons? Or if you have a certain store you always go to first, why is that? And what are those reasons? These situations where things don't always go perfect are an amazing marketing moment. Because if you can take any situation where you've turned that around, it's just you can you can build a, a sticky factor and a and a loyalty to your company that can cost you hundreds of dollars in other places. And so it's it's awesome when I say hold for it. Um, the next one here, I have some examples. Even sometimes it's things like you know sending customer swag. So uh, Next Tech recently transitioned over to uh, streaming service, streaming only service, Next Tech TV now. And I was doing a lot of training things with the public on this. And every time I would have uh, one or two customers come that already had our service, even though this was a training event, and they just wanted to learn more tips and tricks was the big thing. And so when I had these people and they would, you know, after the presentation, they would talk about how great we are and whatever else, you better believe I've got their name and, and address. And we sent them something, some next tech swag type thing. You know what I mean? Um, and I have a feeling that this type of thing has also been discussed over and over from a marketing aspect. But you got to remember your frontline people are just one more connection of that. Um, I say marketing is the sales that brings them to you to get them to contact you. And then this next step needs to be closing and making that action. And so marketing and these sales things, they've got to work together, where the, whether it's a business aspect, a customer aspect, um, they're, that's got to be left brain, right brain. They've got to work together. And this is a, another great example of empowering the people, letting them making those choices and making those decisions to go ahead and take care of that. Conflict resolution. <laughs> we never have conflict being in customer service and customer sales. That just never occurs. <clears throat> and you guys are all secretly chuckling in your breath. Yeah. So who do we have conflict with? Obviously, the first one there is customers. Customers come in hot. They're upset about something. Um, I always say, if you want to make somebody angry, mess with their children or mess with their money. And boy, do they get hot quickly. And so customer bills or something else can be an issue. But sometimes it can be employees. You know, sometimes employees just have different personalities. They don't always see eye to eye. And so you got to make sure your team is working together. I mean, it, they got to work as a team. They got to work together. And sometimes it's even how we view conflict. You know, I mean, you got to learn the personalities of your people. One person may just come come in guns a-blazing conflict. I'm going to hit you just as hard as you're going to hit me. Others going to be very timid. And they're just going to kind of shy away from any sort of conflict. And you need to understand your your people and their personality and help them adjust to multiple personalities, adjust to these different people coming in. Um, I want to say build a thick skin, but sometimes you have to make sure they understand when these people are coming in hot, they're mad about the situation. They're going to seem to attack you, but they're mad about the situation. And so how should we react? You know, and you want to uh, you want to prepare for that and plan for that and build these people. Um, and really, conflict is a listening thing. Conflict is listening. Uh, one of the biggest things I do for any sort of uh, conflict resolution, I like to take notes and write things down. And so tell me what's going on. What went wrong here? I understand you're unhappy. Could you tell me about the situation? And then I write notes of things that I hear them say two or three times. Okay. They've said this was important. You know I mean? We shouldn't have done this. And so I've, I've kind of write notes, whatever else, because those are the hot points. Those are the things I want to, I want to, I want to make sure we address. And then of course, you know, our response, you know I mean? How should we respond to that? Do we fight fire with fire? Do we just give in and say the customer is always right? You know, and you need to kind of plan your, your response accordingly. Um, I will tell you on, a, on Luke's personal level, customer is not always right. Um, now, how do we do that? I have to politely educate and inform them of that <laughs> in a very, in a certain way. You know, I don't sit there and say, you are wrong. Um, that doesn't work well, you know, um, 
It'd be like telling my wife she's wrong. That's never a good idea. But it's one of those things where if you can kind of sit there and say, okay, here's some of the problems we're going to run into if we if we go that route. Or, you know, here's some of the, here's the problem I'm seeing. Let's look for a solution together. Um, there's just, there's all sorts of th certain things that we can come up with. So really with that, guys, I mean, again, I call it a crash course, but those are some of the really important basic things that I really think that you need to, to focus on and look at. I definitely want, I, I feel this will generate a lot of conversation. Mm -hmm.